you're going to have to go to the office. We'll have to settle the this class. Then. Student outbursts like these disrupt learning. It's the sometimes that the teachers were kind of losing the battle. What's the problem? But instead of just punishing them, this school rewards them for not being suspended. Discipline in the classroom has come a long way. They would um, compare which teacher had the biggest belt, which teacher had the biggest paddle, only to face a new set of problems. When you say, well, I'm calling home, they sometimes say, well, there's nobody there. Okay. As society changes, so does classroom discipline. I am not here to be liked by you, but I am here to be respected by you. A guide to the do's and don'ts of discipline. But you have to remain in control and try to settle the thing without letting it escalate anymore. On this episode of Teacher TV. Crime and punishment for naughty students once meant facing the schoolmaster's wrath and rod. They would um, compare their belts and their paddles, which teacher had the biggest belt, which teacher had the biggest paddle. Spanking was popular at school and at home. In 1962, parents cited spanking as the discipline they used most. But a recent survey shows that time out, removing a child from a situation where the misbehavior occurs, has become the most popular form of punishment among parents. Spanking is now way down on their list. A similar shift is taking place in schools. 24 states and many localities have banned the use of corporal punishment in schools. While society is embracing more humane ways of disciplining children, other shifts have taken place as well. In a one-room schoolhouse, the teacher was hired to reinforce existing community values. Now I think we spend a good deal of time instilling values. Students don't have the fear factor that we had. If someone told me that they were going to call my mother or father, that would have been it. But now, when you say, well, I'm calling home, they sometimes say, well, there's nobody there. True, some of the old discipline methods may no longer work for today's teachers, but the challenge of maintaining classroom discipline remains the same. Do any of you have any questions about If you're a teacher, this probably looks familiar. Apathy. Look, look at this. Kevin, 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 I told you. Or the other extreme, back. defiance. We'll talk about no, no, no. Discipline and the American student's lack of it is frequently topic A among educators. I think probably the number one reason a lot of young teachers get out of teaching is because of discipline problems. Ronald Kearns is an instrumental music teacher at John F. Kennedy High School in Montgomery County, Maryland. One, two, ready, go. In his 18 years as a teacher, he's developed a classroom management style. He's a no-nonsense, self-confident figure right down to his authoritative coat and tie. And what he's learned about discipline, he's had to learn on his own. Nowhere in my case of teacher training did anyone address the issue of discipline and how to handle certain situations. From what this group of middle and high school teachers had to say, Ronald Kearns is not alone. Well, I remember taking a lot of the, uh, the methods courses and... Uh, and hearing all this theory on how it's supposed to be done and how it's supposed to work and and if you do all these great things with your students that they'll want to learn and everything will be fine um, and I tried that the first day of student teaching and it wasn't fine they teach about Piaget they don't teach about what to do when Johnny says go jump in a lake or to turn to his neighbor and curses at him they don't tell you about that how should teachers discipline students there's no single answer what works for one teacher may not work for another also not all students react to discipline the same way Psychologist Stephen Silverman says good discipline, whatever form it takes, is crucial to a child's development. But uh, today's youngsters are asking for structure. They're asking for limits. They're asking for definition. Mm -hmm. They're asking for consistency. And they're asking for you to evoke the moral values that they already have inside them. We asked these Montgomery County, Maryland teachers and Dr. Silverman how they handle discipline problems high on the list of teacher concerns. You may want to compare their responses with your own ideas. Right, okay. Janet Rodkey's television production class acted out four scenarios. First, the talker. The one who's often bright but can't seem to contain herself and ends up interrupting the entire class. Kathy was like, the quiz is for you two on Friday, right? How do you quiet a talker without turning off the student? You try to use humor, I think, first and see if that will work, you know. Like, um, you know, guy, these guys sound really cute, but, you know, we need to get back to whatever. From humor, you go to separation, and that could be temporary just for that day. You can be more effective in a lot of cases 
by not saying anything, just by looking and taking that, that dramatic pause in class that tells everybody, wow, all eyes are on me. How about the student who can't get along with his peers? His verbal or physical jousting often masks a fragile self-esteem. What do you say to this kind of student without further damaging his self-esteem? Please step outside. I need you to step outside and cool down a bit. Nothing, you know, nothing real aggressive, nothing real confrontational. The idea that if you're, you're not, you don't want to fuel that fire. Yeah. I think very few students really want to have a battle. And in a sense, they are waiting for you to be the calming factor. So I think for a teacher to stay as calm as possible and sometimes almost whisper and say, come here, can we? So that the tone is brought down because mm -hmm. if you are, are calm and very low, then they have to stop what they're doing in some cases to listen to you. Make sure that the one that you're separating knows that you're not placing blame. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to say, you know, because they're going to come back at you and say, but, but he started it. I didn't start it. And you say, well, you know, I know you didn't, but I'm, I'm depending on you right now to, uh, to have a level head. Kevin, Kevin, tell me you read Kevin, this. Kevin. A growing concern among teachers is the defiant student, the one who verbally, even physically, challenges a teacher in the classroom. Left out That's the entire entire <laughs> what should you do when confronted by the defiant student? Before you do anything, keep control of the situation by staying calm, breathing deeply, even counting to ten before you respond. And using another student I have found is helpful in a situation like that, because that student can go out and say, what are you doing? It's just a test, and you know, Mr. McDonald's not that bad of a guy, and da 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 they can, they can deflate it while you're still with the room, while you're thinking of your own options in your mind of how to handle it. The University of Georgia's Marilyn Gutman and other discipline experts suggest a few other options. First, try to calm the student by speaking softly and slowly. Don't try to physically restrain him or her, and never resort to humiliation or sarcasm. Second, say, I can see you're very upset. As soon as you are calmer, I'd like to discuss whatever is bothering you. Listen carefully to the answer, giving the student your full attention. Don't ask why. Doing so demands a defensive response. If the student will not discuss the problem, ask if he or she would rather speak to someone else, like the guidance counselor or encourage them to write down the problem and give it to you later that day. Help the student find alternative solutions to the problem. You want to find some way that they can back down and save face, any way you possibly can. If they'll take the note and go to the office, if they'll wait outside a little bit, find some way that they can save themselves. Since some defiant behavior is as much for the peers as it is for the teacher, you may want to remove the audience by asking the defiant student to step outside the room or to a less crowded area of the classroom. When the situation is settled, you can focus on the rest of the class. And then I came back to the room, and sure enough, the classes, they're, they're real tense, you're real tense, and you have to do something. And so I just try to lighten the moment by saying something like, well, that was exciting for a moment. And then they kind of laugh, and it's a nervous laugh. But everybody now is like, okay, everything's okay. He's not going to be angry at us because of what this kid just did. You may need to call on the counselor or the school nurse or the school psychologist uh, or an administrator to work through what's on this youngster's mind because it will reappear in another form if you don't work it through. Finally, research has shown that the most common concern among teachers is the student who doesn't pay attention in class and half-heartedly earns C's and D's, even though he or she may be quite bright. What do you do with an apathetic student? If the student gave a really exceptionally good answer or tried hard another day, I try to remember that and say, well, Sue, uh, you gave us such a good answer yesterday or whatever, what can you add today or something, then the student feels either the teacher thinks I'm smart, I must be smart, I can give an answer, or B, the teacher likes me, I'll try. Get close enough to that person so that that person becomes the center. And if everybody's eyes are following me and I walk back to that person, then that person knows that the rest of the class has figured out that she's not paying attention. Uh, I'll say... Okay, um, Sue, I see that you, um, that you um, missed the last question, so you know I'm coming back to you. Ronald Kearns and his colleagues have only scraped the surface of effective discipline strategies. Their ideas demonstrate that good solutions to discipline problems can be as diverse as the teachers putting those ideas into practice. Sharing proven strategies with colleagues is one way to learn to manage discipline. Kearns suggests another, that educators look back to their own teachers for some answers. The teacher yeah. that I modeled my behavior after was a very frail, little gray-haired lady. 
and she would come in and let us know, I am not here to be liked by you, but I am here to be respected by you. Like me if you choose, but respect me you will. Coming up. It just made me feel really more mature. She's finally thinking before doing. Teaching self-discipline to students. Next on Teacher TV. Welcome to a most unusual award ceremony in Pensacola, Florida. Sixty recipients from the Brentwood Middle School are being congratulated with certificates and pizza for not being suspended. We're really, really proud of you. All 60 were facing suspension for 10 days at one time or another during the year. But they avoided that penalty by taking part in a unique program called the Anger Management Workshop. It teaches troubled students that they have a choice in how they behave and gets them to make a commitment to change. Mr. King said I've been doing a lot better in math because I've been getting my work done. And Seventh grader Katrina Morris took the workshop when she was yeah. facing suspension for fighting. It just made me, made me feel really more mature. And I found out a lot of stuff what I could have done before I did and after what I did. She's finally thinking before doing, which is what I wanted in the first place. The anger management workshop grew out of a discipline dilemma at Brentwood. It seemed like sometimes that the teachers were kind of losing the battle. During a recent school year, two-thirds of Brentwood students were sent to the office for misbehaving. Suspensions were rampant, and teachers had no clear guidelines for addressing the problem, so they left discipline to the assistant principal. What it was doing was overburdening the people that were handling discipline, and the teachers simply weren't addressing the problem, they were simply getting rid of it. To tackle the problem, the school took a team approach to discipline that involves students, teachers, guidance counselors, and parents. A faculty committee created clear and consistent rules, incentive programs to encourage positive behavior, and special classes for students who are disciplined problems. A six-part classroom infractions procedure gives teachers a step-by-step -step process to document, standardize, and better manage discipline. It gives me a place to write everything down. You used to have to keep these kind of things inside your grade book and you don't have enough space. So this one gives you the chance to see from step to step what you've already done. The infraction procedure starts with a simple warning and progresses through nine stages to a parent conference if necessary. If those steps fail, Susan Chambers steps in with anger management, a child's last chance to avoid suspension. You agree to do your best to control your attitude and emotions and to be a positive student at Brentwood Middle School. As All of these kids are facing suspension for problems ranging from cursing at a teacher to striking another student. I feel that peer pressure is an excuse that adults have given to kids to do what they want to do. Suzanne okay. Chambers is getting set to start today's anger workshop. It's an all-day session held during school where students learn to think before getting angry. If they make it through the day, they avoid suspension. They need to be in school. They don't need to be home. It causes a problem for the parents. The students' grades are going to suffer. To participate in the workshop, children and their parents or guardians must arrive before school begins to sign a contract. And I do need a phone number of someone to contact in case there should be a problem. Students agree to try a new approach with their anger, and parents must promise to discuss the seminar when the child gets home. Officials say including parents in the process is essential. If they aren't involved and don't buy into it. Why would the student? Here, all parents are helping with kids. And if he's a problem at school and she's in it, she can help them. Suzanne is a delinquency counselor for the state of Florida. And through a state grant, she now works out of Brentwood, yeah. where she runs seminars and maintains close contact with troubled with students, their teachers, and parents. If you throw something, they're shooting a deadly missile. Once the parents leave, you know Suzanne takes the students through an entire day of awareness training. In one exercise, they sit in pairs to find something positive to say about each other. He likes baseball girls and basketball. His idol is baby. Suzanne says this exercise helps build self-esteem. Later, she encourages each student to speak about why they're there and shows them ways to think before acting. 
if you can remember this minute, the next time somebody snatches a pencil out of your hand, if you can remember me holding on to your wrist and saying, I need to make time to think, mm -hmm. you won't get suspended again. Then she asks them all to consider do. the consequences of their actions. And what happened because you skipped class? And I was out of school for two days, and I, um, I was on punishment for those two days. I couldn't go outside. Y'all told me what all happened to you. That doesn't sound like much fun, does it? Didn't sound like fun to me. I wouldn't like being on punishment. At day's oh, end, each here. student is asked to make a I commitment like to, to change. To My commitment is not disturbing other people. And just go in there and sit down and do my work. And don't threaten nobody. And not to cuss no more. And when somebody, somebody call me names, you just have to go tell the teacher. Think about me holding your wrist, Rath, and remember what I asked you to do. Before they leave for the day, students meet with the assistant principal and the school guidance counselor. The message? You're not alone. You've got a lot of people around here that you can go to for help. Yeah. If you just say there's a problem. Kids must honor their commitment to change or face suspension. But for many, the message seems to be getting through. Discipline referrals are down by 30% from last year, and students like Katrina Morris are making gains. I know the other day she called me and she said, I knew I was going to be fine. But I didn't, you know, which is great. The whole key in working with middle schoolers today, I think, is choices. And they need to understand that the choices that they make in their life now are going to affect them throughout the rest of their life. Up next. Hey, would you pour us some tea? How one teacher turns tea time into a special time with his students when Teacher TV continues. While most second graders at Peakview Elementary play outside for recess, one student gets a taste of something more genteel. All right, it's time for tea time, Nikki. You want to go ahead and put your tea in? Each morning, a different student has Let tea time with a teacher they call Mr. T, Bill Talkington. Raspberry Royal, and I noticed last time that you had some Earl Grey. Today, like seven-year-old well, Nikki what, what, Jordan gets to sit in Mr. T's chair to review her schoolwork, sip tea, so and munch cookies. Each student has ball. tea time twice a year. It lasts around 20 minutes and gives Bill Talkington like second graders fun. valuable time alone with their teacher. The first time it was just to get acquainted, you know, enjoy the ritual and enjoy the specialness of it. The second time that we've been going through, I wanted to be sure to try to cover some of the materials in. Um, their portfolios or in the writing journals. And so we make make a connection with some of the expectations that we have here at school. Blueberries are blue and good, and I like to eat them today. You know, your spelling has been so good, even from the beginning of the year. Bill Talkington got the idea for tea time from special visits he had with neighbors when he was a child. Now he says it's special for his students. They know tomorrow who's going to have tea here. Um, and so they go home and they tell their folks, tomorrow's tea time for me. And do you remember, how do you hold your pinky? Got to get your pinky up there. What makes tea time fun? Get to drink tea. Get to drink tea. What else? Eat cookies. <laughs> yeah. And talk. And talk. While tea time makes kids in Colorado feel special, in Florida, everyone makes the tea. The middle school years are a time when children need to feel a sense of belonging. And experts say when a 10 or 11 year old is denied that opportunity at school, results can be devastating. Well, at Brentwood Middle School, students are cheering a new policy that encourages self-worth. Meet the Brentwood cheerleaders, all 48 of them. Normally, only 12 of these girls make the cut each fall. And you have many more that are devastated than the ones who are ecstatic. Coach Sally Nobles expressed concern to the school principal. And she said, well, let's just let them all make it. And that's what we did. Now anyone, regardless of ability or appearance, can become a cheerleader by showing up regularly for practice. I probably wouldn't have made it if we only had 12 girls because I'm not that good, but I like it. <laughs> I was really excited. I didn't expect to make it. Educators here say this no-cut policy is a big boost to fragile young egos. 
when you're 10, 11, or 12 years old, it's just a little young to be told that you're not good enough to do something. This year, three hearing-impaired girls made the team. I enjoy going to the games and cheering. I liked being with the other hearing girls. Officials say the new policy had its lighter moments, too. This year, there were so many cheerleaders, the team slumber party had to be held in the school cafeteria. But no one seemed to mind. Well, I think it's a good lesson in giving everybody a chance and being a better human being and not thinking that you have to be cute and wonderful all the time to make it in this life, because you don't. For information about this program, including a list of contacts and a written summary, or to order a video cassette, call toll-free 1-800-229-4200. Call between 9 and 4.30 Eastern Time, Monday through Friday, 1-800-229-4200. Can you imagine a suit of armor fit for an elephant? It's a fragment of the past still preserved at the Tower of London, next on Unseen Treasures. After that, TLC blasts off on a journey to Beekman's world. Shh. <laughs>